Thank you, Paul. Well, the topic today is to provide an update on concussion. And boy, this is something that's been in the news a lot. And I, as a sports physician, I have big concerns about the hysteria that's been created around this injury. And I really view it as a threat to sports and potentially health. And I want to tell you why I'm saying that. Let's start by uh, just definitions of what constitutes a concussion. <coughs> the American Academy of Neurology define concussion as a clinical syndrome of biomechanically induced alteration of brain function, typically affecting memory and orientation, which may or may not involve a loss of consciousness. And I think the point to be made there is it's biomechanical forces causing symptoms of concussion. The Zurich Group, this is a group of concussion experts which have met many times, uh, most recently defined it as a complex pathophysiologic process affecting the brain induced by traumatic, again, biomechanical forces. In my mind, the simplest definition of a concussion is a temporary disturbance of brain function that occurs without any structural change in the brain. So it's important to understand that nobody dies from a concussion. Concussions, by definition, uh, resolve themselves. They're not serious. There's no structural change of the brain. So when we talk about concussion, we have to understand and differentiate it from potentially more severe effects, which may or may not be related to repeated concussions. And so, for instance, if you get a scan, in this case, this, the cause of this patient's headache is not a concussion. It's a large spear that's been stuck in their head. And so, again, my point is the, the scanning and any other testing are going to be normal in an athlete with concussion. Now, the incidence of concussion has been very variously reported in the United States. Certainly, the most common definitions and concerns are in American football. And it's been estimated that there are 300,000 sports-related concussions in the United States yearly. I think that number is way low and is not accurate. It's been estimated anywhere from 3.6 to 5.6 per season in high school players, 4 to 6.8 percent of college football players. I think anybody that cares, particularly for American football athletes, knows that these numbers nowhere nearly represent how commonly this injury occurs. And to illustrate this, we did a study a few years back looking at uh, 279 college football players. And instead of asking them if they have a, had had a concussion, we gave them the symptoms of concussion. And we asked, have you ever had these symptoms related to hitting your head in football either during practice or a game? Not surprisingly, 82 percent had previous, or 84 percent had previously had symptoms of a concussion, with the vast majority having symptoms that constituted grade one concussion symptoms. And at that time, a grade one was defined as symptoms that went away within 15 minutes. 31 percent had previous grade two symptoms, and 10 percent had previous grade three symptoms. We then asked them in the, in the last game you played in prior to completing this survey, did you have any of these symptoms? 15 percent of players had concussion symptoms in the game they had played in just prior to com completing the survey. So certainly in my mind a more accurate number is 85 percent or so a career, 15 percent a game is probably a much more likely estimate of how frequently concussions occur. And in fact, this is backed up by NFL players and when you look at the higher you go in football, I think the more common the concussions occur. Gary Plummer, a 14-year NFL linebacker, had this to say, as a middle linebacker in the NFL, if you don't have five of these grade one concussions each game, you're going to lose your spot in the next game. So clearly these happen very frequently at the highest levels of sport. Well, how did we get here in football and why is this such an epidemic in American football. And I really think you have to look back to the origins of the game, which really traces back to rugby in the UK. And when it came to the United States, it was initially played with, played with a round ball, looked nothing like the sport we have today. The first game in the college level was played in November 6, 1969, involving Rutgers and Princeton University. The, big, the game changed, though, when Walter Camp, who's been termed the father of American football, who played at Yale and then later coached there, pioneered rule changes that led to the game as we see it today. And the game has flourished on every level, but particularly financially. Uh, the American Professional Football Association was formed in 1920, and this gave way to the National Football League. And next to college football, the, our, uh, the highest rated television events occur in the NFL. And, in, and last year, the NFL made $7.2 billion in revenue. And if you look at the 50 most watched sporting events, 49 of them are NFL football games. 
the, the next highest rated uh, television sporting events next to NFL football games are the college football championship series game. Last year, the Super Bowl was watched uh, by over 114 million people around the world. So this is a, a sport which has garnered tremendous interest and is making a huge amounts of money. Now, I think when you talk about concussions, you have to look at, back at the evolution of the American football helmet. Interestingly, uh, football helmets did not become mandatory at the college level until the late 30s. The first helmets were made of leather and moleskin, and they were pr primarily meant to protect the ears, and they called them a head harness. Later on, padding was added, and then in the 40s, it gave way to plastic shells uh, that were, again, filled with padding and suspension uh, straps to protect the head. Later, the, this uh, plastic gave way to a par polycarbonate alloy and vinyl-coated steel, which increased the durability and the protection offered by these helmets. In the 1950s, face masks were added to the football helmet to further increase protection in this, in this sense of safety with our football helmets. And today, the American football helmet looks nothing like these early helmets. It consists of a hard polycarbonate shell, an energy-absorbing foam lining inside, and a spring-like face mask that today, these helmets offer a very custom fit and they can just dissipate tremendous forces applied to the head and allow the player to use the head as a battering ram and inflict punishment with their head. They feel protected, almost invincible with the helmets of today, so often they're using the head as a weapon. The important point to be made, though, is the helmet does nothing to cushion the brain inside the skull. And the more protection you offer on the outside, the more they have a feeling that they're invincible, the more that brain is slamming against the skull when it is suddenly stopped. And we learned that, foot, that helmets can be dangerous to sports, and we, it took us 30 years to realize this with boxing. And if you notice this year, for the first time since 1984, uh, before uh, actually the 1980 Olympics, headgears were no longer a part of Olympic boxing. It's interesting that headgears were added in 1984 out of concern of the dangers of boxing at the Olympic level, and immediately they noticed that the rates of knockouts and bouts being stopped due to head blows doubled. But we failed to believe the data. It took almost 30 years before we finally stopped, studied this, and realized we are doing more harm than good with these helmets. And in fact, when they removed the helmet, studies showed a 50% lower rate of concussion when the headgear was removed. Now, one of the most talked about issues today is what is the effect of these repeated concussions? I've already told you these happen exceedingly commonly. And do these repeated concussions have a cumulative effect? The so-called chronic traumatic encephalopathy has been described as a sequelae of repeated concussions. This was initially uh, noted in a JAMA case report in 1928. It was termed dementia pugilistica or the punch drunk syndrome. In the early years, all of the cases of this chronic traumatic encephalopathy were described in professional boxers. It really was a poorly defined syndrome with various definitions. It was primarily used in case-based descriptions of various neurologic symptoms that we would see with boxers. Now, one of the poster childs for this has been Muhammad Ali. And if you've followed Muhammad Ali, you've seen him develop sort of a Parkinson's-like syndrome, uh, progressive neurologic dysfunction, changes in his personality uh, that progressed over a number of years. And Ali recently died, uh, I believe he was close to the age of 80, but suffered with this during the latter years of life. But what's interesting is the descriptions of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, dementia pugilistica, primarily were in heavyweight slugging type boxers intended to correlate with the length of their career and the number of bouts they fought. So one of the classic, uh, more likely examples is Jerry Quarry, who was a heavyweight fighter in the United States who took a lot of punch punishment. He was a slugger who got in and absorbed blows, blow after blow, unlike Muhammad Ali, who was never knocked out in his professional career and is a fighter who never took a lot of direct hits. So it's interesting that Muhammad Ali has been sort of uh, associated with this dementia pugilistica when really a better description would be a fighter like Jerry Quarry. Now this, had, again, had been entirely described in professional boxers up until 2005 when Bennett Amalu first described a case of this chronic traumatic encephalopathy in a football player. 
From there, Anne McKee and what's called the Sports Legacy Institute have been studying the brains of various football players and other athletes, and she has come to the conclusion that the hallmark lesion of this chronic traumatic encephalopathy is the depo deposition of phosphorylated tau protein in various areas of the brain. And she described this again as the hallmark pathology, and when she found this, by her definition, this patient is suffering from the effects of repeated head injury. Now, McKee has gone on to link this to depression, to suicide, to ALS, even to homicide on the basis of this head injured victim as being responsible for these various behaviors. Now, she's come up with these diagnostic criteria for CTE, and you can see the list of symptoms here. And when these symptoms occur eight to 10 years after an athlete has experienced repetitive, mild traumatic brain injury, you would make the diagnosis of CTE. Now, if you look at this list, this is half the patients in my office. I mean, this to me does no good. I mean, this could be the diagnostic criteria for everything, um, you know, from depression to fibromyalgia to the low T syndrome or menopausal symptoms. And so the, the, the concern on my part is that as soon as someone suffers one of these symptoms, which invariably they're going to have these at some point in their life, they're going to harken back to that concussion they had, uh, and probably inappropriately so. Well, how did we get here with this idea of CTE? Well, it started with the index case, and this fellow pictured here is Mike Webster. They called this guy Iron Mike Webster, uh, one of the most famous football players and the most famous and storied football teams, the Pittsburgh Steelers. He played the most seasons and the most games uh, in, in history for that football club. And at the end of it, he was named to the Hall of Fame as a center, uh, but Mike died of a heart attack in 2002. Now, before that, he suffered from severe memory and behavioral problems. In fact, he ended up homeless, living in his car, suffering with depression, uh, and it was a very sad case. But interestingly, Iron Mike Webster was never treated for a concussion that was actually listed as an injury that he suffered in the injury reports from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Granted, they probably weren't as aggressive as diagnosing him, but never diagnosed with a concussion during his career. He was the first case that Bennett Amalu described uh, as the index of, of CTE or this dementia pugilistic in a football player. Then came Andre Waters uh, back in 2006, who was an NFL defensive back in the late 80s, played 11 seasons in the NFL. And Andre Waters was a ferocious hitter. In fact, he had the nickname of Dirty Waters because he often took shots at pe people, leading with his head, using it to inflict punishment. Now, Andre Waters later went on to become a successful uh, college football coach, but he never got an NFL job, and he always felt slighted and upset by that. Later on in his life, Andre Waters went through a, a bitter divorce with a custody battle over his daughter. He became very depressed, and he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head in 2006. Now, Waters' brain was again examined by Bennett Amalu, who found the same sort of changes of CTE, which then he was using almost interchangeably for early Alzheimer's disease. The third case that Amalu described was that of Dave Duerson, who was a defensive back for, again, another storied football team, the Chicago Bears, in the late 80s. Dave Duerson was a graduate, an honors graduate of Notre Dame. He went on to a very successful uh, NFL career where he played in four different Pro Bowl games. Uh, when he retired from the NFL, he was very successful in business, became a multimillionaire off of his business dealings. But then he lost all of his money. He had some bad investments, went through some very rough times in his life, uh, and in that meantime, he served on an NFL retired players board, and this issue was sort of highlighted in the movie Concussion. But Dorsten began to suffer from chronic headaches and memory loss, which was attributable he thought, to CTE. And so he shot himself in the chest, specifically for the purpose of asking them to examine his brain to look for changes of CTE. This was the third case that Bennett Amalu described when he found these changes in the brain. And based on the fact that two of the three of his first three uh, cases had committed suicide, he said that suicide must be related to CTE. And this was sort of the basis for this movie, Concussion in the United States, which tells the story of Bennett Amalu uh, you know, overcoming obstacles to inform everybody that football causes CTE. But it's interesting, if you look at the early writings on dementia pugilistica, suicide was never considered a clinical feature in the first 80 years of writing related to CTE. And in fact, in 2009, uh, McKee uh, did a, uh, a large uh, 
cohort, looked at a large cohort of all the known cases of CTE, and he cons did not consider suicidality to be associated with CTE based on his research of this condition. What's interesting, in 2011, or 2012, there was a study of, of retired NFL football players, and the study showed that they were 40% less likely to die by suicide than men in the general population. So that certainly does not fit with the descriptions, the two out of three on Amalu's uh, small little study who concluded suicidality was a part of CTE. It doesn't line up with the data. What's more concerning to me is that between 1960 and 2007, there were nine reported suicide deaths in former NFL players. But in the last two years, there have been six suicides in former NFL players. The most important thing to understand are there are no published studies showing a relationship between contact sports, CTE, and the risk of suicide. Now, if you think it, about it in perspective, you have to ask yourself, why aren't more NFL football players committing suicide? And if you look at the risk factors for suicide, these are commonly held by former NFL football players. Many of these players have a history of steroid use, and studies suggest a link between steroid use and suicide. Many of these former NFL players also suffer from chronic pain. In fact, 80% of players reported in a phone survey that they were dealing with moderate to severe problems related to chronic pain from their NFL football career. We know that people who are in chronic pain have higher rates of depression, more problems with sleep, all of which would likely increase the risk for suicide. We also know that many former NFL players use prescription opioids to manage pain. In fact, 70% of players former NFL players reported excessive use of opioids. We also know that many of these ex-NFL players deal with life and particularly financial stress. In fact, it's been sh shown that 80% of all retired NFL players within three years after they retire are broke, that, fi uh, that end up fi filing for bankruptcy uh, because they have depleted, have not managed their money and have depleted their savings. So all of these things certainly can exacerbate depression symptoms, chronic pain. So I have to ask, is a history of head injury perhaps protective for suicide when we find that despite all of these risk factors, NFL players are 40% less likely to commit suicide than the general population? Now, they've taken it even a step further to me, again, with very little evidence. And this is a, a tragic case, Chris Benoit, who is a former pro wrestler from Canada. And Benoit, uh, uh, very late in his career, uh, inexplicably murdered his wife and son in his home, and he hanged himself with a cable from his weight machine in his home gym in 2007. Chris Nowitzki, who works with Ann McKee uh, and has sort of headed up this Sports Legacy Institute, actually had, had wrestled with Benoit uh, early in, in his career, and he felt certain that perhaps his repeated concussions were to blame. So on autopsy, the brain of Chris Benoit showed similar findings suggestive in Ann McKee's opinion, of CTE. And the father, his father, obviously clings to this as the reason why he would do something so horrific as murder his wife and child. Another case that to me sort of defies the logic is that of Frank Gifford. Frank Gifford was a 12-year NFL uh, running back, playing for the New York Giants, actually elected to the Hall of Fame as well, and then he went on to a highly successful television uh, career as a sports commentator. This picture here shows an epic hit uh, inflicted by Chuck Bednarik on Frank Gifford in this famous photo that was appeared in Sports Illustrated of Bednarik standing over Gifford, and Gifford missed the entire 1961 season after this blow with symptoms related to a post-concussive syndrome. But Frank Gifford lived a long, full, and successful life, and when he died in 2015, it was of natural causes. He was 85 years old when he died, and the family asked that his brain be studied. Well, they found changes of CTE. Now, if I can get to 85 and have the kind of career Frank Gifford had, I think I would take CTE. Now, more concerning, they're finding it in more and more athletes. Just recently, a star BMX bike racer, Dave Mira, shot himself inexplicably. Autopsy showed CTE. Patrick Grange, a former college soccer player, died from ALS. They biopsied his brain, found changes of CTE. It's been recorded in baseball players, uh, lacrosse players. It's coming to a sport near you, no doubt, uh, sometime soon. And Anne McKee had this statement to say, even subconcussive trauma where no symptoms are experienced can cause degradation of the brain. 
She went on to say it's looking more and more that there's a connection between ALS-like diseases and traumatic injury. Now these are huge leaps that she have, she's making and they come, in my opinion, with a cost. We have to look closely at what is the significance of these tau protein deposits in the brain. Because McKee defines CTE pathology as accumulations of this phosphorylated tau and if they have it, she makes the diagnosis. You can only make it post-mortem. We need to understand that hyperphosphorylation of tau is seen in a wide variety of conditions including just normal aging we see. And in fact, one noted neuropathologist said, I got bad news from you. We're all dying from a cr cr uh, chronic tauopathy. We all get it as we age. The important take home, there is no evidence that it signifies a distinct neurodegenerative disease. And more importantly, no proof that it could cause such a complex range of behaviors such as depression, substance abuse, suicidality, personality change, cognitive impairment, homicidality. This is ridiculous that we are making this leap so prematurely. And the lay press really has accepted this as gospel. They've reported it like it's a done deal that we have found this link between contact sports and CTE, when again, there is no widely accepted diagnostic criteria for either the neuropathology or the clinical features, as I mentioned, and McKee's definition of this makes it so broad that almost anybody who's had a concussion could, is likely going to suffer from CTE. More importantly, there is no controlled epidemiologic study that has quantified this risk for any sport, and that is an important take-home message for all of us. However, I see the media reports continuing. In fact, they're getting more and more frequent. And I think they are having a significant adverse psychological effect on current and retired athletes, particularly football players, but I'm seeing soccer being next. In fact, anybody who's in, been involved in a contact sport, they are going to be worried about this. And we are already seeing an effect on sports participation. Youth football participation rates are way down. And I believe that soccer will be next as more and more of these athletes are identified. And I think, in the long run, this is going to compound the inactivity problem in kids. And I think that the fear over this has likely played a role in the suicide of several athletes, most notably Todd Ewan. Todd Ewan was an 11-year NHL player. Uh, during his career, he was a pro prolific fighter. They called him the animal because he was involved in over 100 fights during his hockey career. Clearly, as most hockey players, certainly one who fights like Ewan, he had a lot of blows to the head. After he retired from the NHL, uh, Todd Ewan, not surprisingly, with that many fights, suffered from anger issues, depression, and uh, when he retired, he became obsessed with worry that he was suffering from CTE. It became so severe after going through a divorce and suffering with depression that he shot himself in the chest, said, biopsy my brain, I know I have CTE. Well, tell you what, he had no changes of CTE on his brain. So Todd Ewan was not suffering from CTE, an incurable disorder. He was suffering from depression, which is a treatable disorder. So for us to tell athletes with any of those symptoms, there's a high likelihood they may have an incurable brain disorder, I think is highly irresponsible. And this statement just came out from uh, one of our soccer icons in America, Brandy Chastain. Came out in all, all the headlines that she's going to donate her brain for CTE research. And listen to this quote from Brandy Chastain. This really concerns me. She says, I never had an official diagnosis of a concussion in my career. She said, But as you grow older, you sometimes say, Gosh, am I losing my memory or did I just, or did I used to forget when I went into a room what I went in there for? Could this be the start of something? I believe we are setting up all of these athletes who have had a concussion during their career to begin to worry every time they have the normal symptoms of aging, the normal senses, uh, symptoms of depression, anxiety, stress, that they are suffering from an incurable brain disorder. So to conclude, it's clear to me that there's unprecedented media attention around sports-related con con concussion and CT, and I think it's way, been way overemphasized and inflated. I think that this is having a chilling effect on contact sports athletes. Certainly I see it in my football players. They are scared to death about the risk of suicide. No doubt it's contributing to increasing rates of depression and suicides as the, as the case of Todd Ewan. And to me more concerning are the long time negative effects on sports participation rates. 
Now, certainly I'm not going to deny that there is a cause for concern with head injuries. We need to be appropriately studying it, but we need to also understand where we are today, and that is there is no evidence for an association between contact sports and CTE. And I think it is imperative that all sports medicine physicians and scientists exercise caution and be circumspect in our communications about this issue because we're going to end up doing more harm than good if we're not paying attention to how we manage this. Thank you.